So Jeremy is one of my coworkers on the Slack desktop runtime team and one of the main contributors to Electron. And um, today he'll be talking about the infamous remote module. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Um, before I start, I want to uh, just take a moment to acknowledge that um, this beautiful place in which I'm lucky enough to live uh, and in which we're meeting today is the unceded uh, traditional land of the Ohlone people who have cared for this place for millennia and who continue to care for this place today. Uh, so hi, uh, my name is Jeremy, um, or if you've seen me on GitHub, you might have seen the name Nornagon. Um, I've been an Electron maintainer since 2018, so about two years. Um, many years ago, I worked on the Chrome uh, team, on working on Chrome packaged apps, which is what eventually became PWAs. Um, but I came to the dark side to work on Electron. Um, and today I want to talk to you about IPC, which stands for Interprocess Communication. Uh, so I'm just going to start with a quick refresher on Electron's process model. So Electron's based on Chrome. Uh, and Chrome puts each tab into a separate process. Um, so there's one controller process uh, called the main process, which is responsible for entering the window frames and talking to the operating system. Um, but all the webby stuff like JavaScript and CSS uh, happens in the renderer process. So they're all related, but the main process is in charge. Um, in Chrome, each renderer process roughly corresponds to a tab. Uh, in Electron, which doesn't really have uh, the idea of tabs, um, there's roughly one renderer process per browser window ish. Um, there's a lot of reasons why this kind of separation is useful. Um, maybe the most user visible one in Chrome is that when a tab crashes, or when a website uh, crashes or freezes, it doesn't take down the entire browser. Um, but it also means that render process can be sandboxed and only be given access to the things that they're supposed to have access to. Um, so when a renderer process wants to make a network request, for instance, um, it doesn't have the access in the operating system to do that by itself. So what it does instead is it sends a message to another process, the main process, saying, hey, can you make this request for me um, to like HTTP colon slash slash um, mybank.com? Um, and then the main process says, uh, decides whether or not um, that pro that uh, who made that request should be allowed to do that or not. So it says, well, are your origins the same? You know, are the, are the cross-origin resource sharing headers here present in this resource? Um, and then, if so, it creates the socket, connects, and passes all that information back to the renderer process. So the main process is acting on behalf of the renderer, which means it's in control. It gets to decide what is and isn't allowed. And this is a really important security principle for Chrome. Okay, so back to Electron. Um, how does IPC work in Electron? Every way of sending messages uh, between processes in Electron is based on these two primitives, uh, IPC renderer and IPC main. Um, so these are two halves of the same API, uh, where IPC renderer is the part that's in the renderer, and IPC main is the part that's available in the main process. So anything that sends messages between processes in Electron is built on these two primitives, uh, including the remote module, which I'm getting to. Um, so this is how these APIs work. Um, you can register an event handler um, on one side, uh, in this case on the main process side, and then send a message from the other side uh, which will cause the event handler to fire in the other process, and it'll pass along this event object, which includes a bunch of information about uh, that event, uh, most importantly, where it came from. Um, and sending messages the other way uh, works about the same. And you also get uh, any data, any arguments that were passed along with that message. Um, sending messages from the main process to the renderer process is a little bit more complicated because you have to know which render process you want to send to, um, since there can be more than one, whereas there's only one main process. OK, but what about the remote module? That was in the title of the talk. Um, so somewhat regrettably, um, there are a lot of tutorials and guides for Electron that suggest that you use the remote module uh, for IPC. And I say regrettably um, because this recommendation turns out to be a bit of a poison chalice. <laughs> so the, the remote module promises like a lot of power and convenience, like you're going to be um, you're going to be so powerful if you drink this. Just prom it's fine. Um, uh, so, but yeah, but at what cost? Um, so, before I get into uh, why you shouldn't use it, let me uh, say a little bit about what it is and how it works. 
So it's remote is a built-in module in Electron um, that's only accessible from the renderer process. And what it does is it lets you pretend that a JavaScript object that lives in the main process is accessible directly in the renderer process as if it were local. So for example, here's a snippet um, of JavaScript that launches an HTTP server from the renderer process. And this will work fine even if node integration is turned off in the renderer process. Um, so this server is actually running in the main process. That's what opened the socket. Um, but anytime it receives a request, it'll send a message over to the uh, renderer process, say like, hey, what should I do with this request? Um, and, then, uh, and then the renderer process will call functions and, and sort of drive it. So all of the logic is happening in the renderer. Um, but all of the uh, actual HTTP things is happening in the main process. So this is pretty cool. Um, under the hood, this is all implemented using IPC main and IPC renderer, um, just like I said, um, along with proxy objects. So proxy object is a JavaScript object whose behavior you get to choose. Um, and you get to define how this JavaScript object works by writing more JavaScript. Um, JavaScript in your JavaScript. Um, so for example, when you access a property on a remote um, object or on a proxy object, um, what we're going to do is send a synchronous IPC message. So we're going to call IPC main uh, dot send, or IPC renderer dot send sync. Um, so that's going to block the renderer process and send a message over to the main process saying like, hey, um, you know, please, please tell me what the prop, the value of this property is. Um, and then when we get the reply back, we'll return that value back to the caller um, who accessed the property. Um, so for instance, if I call some remote object property, that's going to result in a send sync happening. Um, and if we get back another object, instead of returning that object directly, we're going to return another proxy object so that chaining works properly. Um, there's also like a little bit of extra magic juice um, that has to be in C++ because we don't have a weak ref um, that hooks into the garbage collector to make sure that if you hold a reference to an object through the remote module in the renderer process that the main process won't garbage collect that and disappear it. Um, so the illusion's pretty convincing. Uh, things look and feel as if they're local in the renderer process, even though they're not. Um, but there are a few problems. The first is that it's slow, like really slow. Um, so imagine you're baking a cake and you ran out of sugar and you're gonna go walk 10 minutes down the shops and get a bag of sugar and then 10 minutes back. If you were using the remote module to get sugar, it would take you six months. If you started baking your cake in winter, you'd be back at your kitchen in summer. Um, so <laughs> that's like a long time. Uh, on my machine, accessing a property on a remote object takes about 100 microseconds, so 0.1 millisecond. Um, accessing a property on a local object takes 0.01 microseconds. It's 10,000 times faster to access something locally than it is to go over IPC. OK, but like computers are really fast. 100 microseconds is still pretty quick. You get like 160 of those in a frame if you're at 60 frames per second. Um, so that's OK if you're just accessing one or two things. Um, but the way the remote module is built so that it looks as if it's local, it's really easy to unintentionally be accessing the remote object like many, many times in order to do simple things and resulting in a lot of IPC round traps. So here's an uh, example of a little API. Um, in the main process, we have a thing. The thing has a rectangle. Um, we can get the bounds and set the bounds of the rectangle. And what we want to do, we're in the renderer process, and we want to make the, that rectangle 100 pixels bigger. Um, so we grab the global, re remote.get global, and we're going to destructure that, get the x, y width height properties, and add 100 and set the bounds. Um, so doing this takes nine IPC round trips, or nearly a full millisecond on my machine. Um, first, we're going to get the global, uh, which returns a proxy object that's controlled by remote. Then we grab the rectangle, which is another proxy object. Um, and we grab the bounds of the rectangle, uh, which is yet another proxy object. So we've got three proxy objects now. And then we have to fetch each of the four properties off the object. Um, so that's four more IPCs uh, sent and received. Um, finally, we grab the rectangle again uh, and call set bounds. So that's nine IPC round trips. Uh, in this code that doesn't look like it has any sort of performance, this is very straightforward code. There's just like two function calls and a destructuring. Um, so this can be really hard to spot in your code. And um, in this particular case, like now that I've identified it and pointed it out, it's obvious that we could like improve this. Um, 
somehow like we could return the XY width height as a, as a string and then that would only be one round trip instead of having to send and re uh, receive like one for each property. Um, or we could add a function that if we controlled this API, we could add like a increase height function, which would just be one round trip. Um, but the problem is that um, uh, because the remote module is so convenient, these things, uh, it's, it's really easy to miss uh, subtle performance um, problems like this. Um, and if that wasn't enough of a headache already, um, there's also the fact that each of these remote calls is a synchronous IPC. So it blocks the entire renderer process whenever there's a remote call happening. So that's no scrolling, no CSS animations, no nothing um, while one of these render, uh, remote objects is uh, in, an, in an IPC call. Um, I'm told it's important to put pictures of cute animals in your presentations. Um, so here's a fruit bat eating a slice of watermelon. <laughs> yeah, pretty good. <laughs> Um, okay, so it's slow. Um, what else? Um, one out of every hundred times you run some pieces of code that you use remote, they fail. Um, okay, let me, let me explain. Um, here's, here's like a JavaScript pattern that is pretty common. Uh, so what we're gonna do is uh, we're gonna tell an object to do some sort of asynchronous thing, in this case, connect. Um, and then we're gonna register an event listener saying like, hey, okay, when you're connected, uh, when you've done that asynchronous thing, um, uh, like I'm gonna do something else. Um, so let me know and I'm gonna um, trigger some, uh, something to happen after it. And this is guaranteed to always work in JavaScript because uh, we know that that event can't be triggered uh, until after this current like thread has finished running because JavaScript is single threaded, right? Um, so we're guaranteed that the event can't be emitted before we're able to register a listener. Um, but if obj is a remote object, um, then this doesn't, is, this is not true. Um, if connect ever takes less time, uh, than the time that it takes to, to send two IPC messages. So that's about 0.2 milliseconds, or, but a lot higher if uh, uh, your machine's under heavy load, if it's busy doing other things. Um, uh, then the event will appear to never trigger. Uh, and I can tell you from experience that this is really, really hard to debug. Um, here's a complicated diagram that illustrates this, but actually I wanna get two volunteers from the audience. Um, if you can fold a piece of paper in half, um, raise your hand. <laughs> All right, do you, do you want to come up? I have some props here to help me out. Some IPC messages. Come on up, come on up. Is this on? It is, fantastic. Okay, I can leave my little den over there. What are your names? Brian. Brian, nice to meet you. And Scott? Scott. You shake your hand. Great to meet you, thanks. Yeah, can we get a round of applause for our volunteers? Okay. Come over this way a little bit, come out from behind the podium. Okay, so I have two IPC messages here. Um, one says, fold me. Um, I'm gonna hand that to you, Brian. Uh, not just yet. <laughs> um, so you're gonna, I'm gonna be the renderer process. Brian here is gonna be the main process, and Scott's gonna be the asynchronous task that's happening. Um, so when I pass you this, uh, this message, fold me, I want you to give that to uh, the asynchronous uh, task to Scott. And Scott, what I want you to do is fold it. There's three, just fold it in half three times and then give it back to Brian. That's all you have to do. Just fold, yeah, it's got like little lines to help you. Um, <laughs> and it, it says on it what to do. So if you forget, uh, it, should, it should be fine. Uh, okay, uh, Brian, so when I, when I give you this uh, fold me message, just hand it over to Scott. That's all you need to do. And then I'm gonna give you this little basket. And our goal here is to get the folded piece of paper in the basket. Um, so if you receive back the folded piece of paper and you're holding the basket, um, put the folded piece of paper in the basket and give it back to me. If you're not holding the basket and you get a folded piece of paper, just drop it on the floor. <laughs> okay, so we got, we got what we're doing? Okay, okay, so main process. Can you fold this for me? Hey, main process, can you tell me when the piece of paper is folded? Awesome, great, that worked fantastic. Our code works, thank you. We have, we have one more to do. We have one more. I'm gonna unfold this and we're gonna try one more time. Okay. Hey, main process, can you fold this piece of paper for me? Sorry, one second. Hey, main process, can you tell me when you get the piece of paper? Okay. So, thank you. Thank you. So, can we get a round of applause? That was fantastic. 
Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Brian. Really appreciate it. OK, so you don't have to look at this diagram. Um, <laughs> Um, there are also like a bunch of other like subtle differences in behavior between remote objects and non-remote objects. Uh, most of the time these don't come up, but when they do, and they will eventually as your app grows and you get more developers working on it, um, it can be really confusing and difficult to debug. Um, so there are, there are all these subtle differences. Um, okay, so it's slow uh, and it's easy to accidentally write race conditions. Um, it's also a gaping security hole. So the remote module represents a huge potential for security issues. Um, if you're sandboxing your app, which you should be doing, as you've heard from a bunch of people um, today already, um, but you're not also disabling the remote module, um, then this is kind of what your sandbox looks like. <laughs> uh, if the renderer process can manage to send this IPC message to the main process, then they have all the privileges that the main process has. Um, uh, if you turn off the remote module in a particular process, then and the main process gets this IPC call, it'll just throw it on the ground and uh, uh, ignore it. So um, if you want to run any kind of code that you don't trust completely, um, then you, you need to be turning off the remote module. OK, but my app doesn't load any untrusted code. I'm safe, right? Um, well, do you load any images? <laughs> um, PNGs are code sometimes. Uh -huh. But also JSON. Uh, so, yeah, so on the Electron team, uh, we looked at all these problems uh, with the remote module, and we decided that we can't really, in good conscience, recommend that people use it. Um, we've seen a lot of large apps, including Slack, make the decision to remove their usage of the remote module entirely. It's not worth um, the ease uh, initially. Um, and it's, it's a lot. It's very difficult to remove the remote module from your app once you've been using it uh, for a while. So it always ends up turning out to have been a bad idea to start, with, start using the remote module, and refactoring it is really um, expensive. Um, so uh, we're going to deprecate the remote module in Electron. Um, it's not going to happen overnight. Thank you. I got one, one cheer. One person's excited about deprecating the remote <laughs> Woo! Um, so it's not happening overnight, um, and we're, uh, you're still going to be able to use the remote module indefinitely if you decide that it's right for you. Um, just going to get a little trickier to use. So in Electron 9, we're going to start printing a deprecation warning if you use the remote module without enabling it like this in the web preferences. Um, and then starting in Electron 10, uh, enable remote module is going to become false by default. So uh, if you want to use the remote module, you have to enable it explicitly. Uh, once we've disabled the remote module uh, by default, we're going to build a version of the remote module that functions as a regular JavaScript library that you can npm install. And once that's working well, we're going to start printing a deprecation warning when you use the built-in version uh, that's going to direct you towards the user land version of remote. Um, and once we've printed that, once we've had the version that prints that deprecation warning will remove it in the following version. And I don't know exactly what version of Electron this is going to be yet, because it depends on a, a V8 feature that Shelley talked about this morning called weak refs being shipped, and I don't know when that's going to ship. Um, so we depend, we're going to depend on that for the user land version of remote. Um, and there's a bug that's pinned on the Electron GitHub repo. If you go and check it out, there's a, a bug that says uh, deprecate the remote module, and that has all of this info in it too. Um, so to be clear, if despite my warnings you still like the remote module and you want to keep using it, you will absolutely be able to. Um, the only difference is that you'll have to require it from an NPM instead of from Electron. The goal of deprecating it and moving it to a third party repository is to make it clear that remote is just one of a lot of different ways that you could choose to structure IPC in your app, and it might not be the best way. OK, so if you're not supposed to use the remote module, uh, what should you be doing instead? Um, the first thing is uh, see if you can get away without doing any IPC at all. Um, there's often, uh, it's the case that a bit of code that's running in the renderer process doesn't have any particularly good reason to be in the renderer process, stuff like setting up a menu. Um, and that can be moved to the main process instead without any trouble, if you're lucky. Um, so if you can, do that. That's great. Um, or you might be able to do, do it the other way around as well, find a bit of code that's running in the main process that has no particular reason to be there, and you can move it to the renderer process where it is called. Um, that's even better where it's possible um, because it frees up the main process to do other things. 
Um, if you really need to send an IPC message uh, to the main process from the renderer and get a response, um, there's an API in Electron version 7 and later called ipcrenderer.invoke. Um, and this lets you carve out a, like an IPC method that's just for you. Um, the, uh, and so you can use this to expose just what the renderer needs. Um, additionally, it's asynchronous, um, so it returns a promise. Um, so it's not going to block the renderer process. And it makes it really obvious when IPC is happening. So it can be a lot easier to debug any sort of um, IPC related issues. So the TLDR um, of this talk is if you want your app to be faster and more secure, and more understandable, um, you should avoid the remote module. Um, you should think carefully um, about when you're sending IPC messages um, and make sure you're only exposing the minimum capabilities that the renderer needs uh, to do its thing. Um, also sandbox your app. Um, <clears throat> uh, so th thanks everyone for listening. You know, please like and subscribe. Um, I, uh, <laughs> Uh, I wrote most of these thoughts down in a Medium post. You can just go to medium.com slash Nornagon and uh, you'll get most of this information. Um, and you can follow me on Mastodon over there. Um, thanks. I think we have time for questions. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Um, we do have time for questions and it seems like there's a lot over there. Hi. So hey. uh, one thing we like the remote module for is that it provides you a guarantee that somebody on the other side of IPC is listening to uh, your function calls. It also provides us um, like a strict interface. Uh, we use TypeScript, so we're able to like import those types over. How do you manage those kind of problems in Slack if you're using Invoke? Uh, I actually can't speak on behalf of Slack because I don't know how the Slack app works. Uh, kind of embarrassing, but um, <laughs> uh, we're still in the pro I do know that we're still in the process of removing remote, so we have, uh, we're still figuring this stuff out. One thing that we did look at was um, there's a library called Comlink, which is designed for talking between uh, web workers and like a main web page um, that, is, that addresses some of these problems if you have more complex IPC needs. Um, Ideally, you would not need that um, because the, your IPC surface should be relatively small. The larger your IPC surface is, um, the dif more difficult it is to audit, and there can be like serious security bugs uh, hiding in IPC. Um, uh, so, yeah, I guess the answer that I have is that I don't have a good answer. <laughs> um, I'm actually su a little surprised that TypeScript works well with the remote module. How does how do you so we have like a set of services defined in the main process and they have a type and we're able to uh, create like an object that defines and then we can just import the type because the type is just a type. Uh, and then we sure, can so see you, exactly you get it off of a remote and then you cost it in the type? Yeah, yeah, yeah. essentially, okay. yes. That makes sense. Yeah. Cool, thanks. Thanks. Uh, I was also curious about the ergonomics around TypeScript, but um, that was asked and answered. So the other question I had was, um, we use IPC, you send a message and you receive multiple responses based on like the status of whatever the process is running in main, potentially. Um, and we're now using Invoke, which is great, uh, but wondering if there's any thought around like chaining Invoke calls so that you could like receive multiple promises in response and await them in different orders and use that as a loading indication? Yeah, that is a great question. So Invoke is only, uh, only supports a request response uh, model, so it's fairly straightforward in that. And the uh, only way that I know currently to do uh, like a streaming, uh, streaming results where you get more than one result is to use uh, the underlying uh, features of IPC render.send and, and, and receive, and then you'll have to manage channels yourself and assign IDs and so on. Um, so that's definitely something that we could improve on. Uh, I think that uh, it would make sense to have uh, something to return a generator. Um, and so you would be able to use um, uh, like async generators to receive multiple responses. I think that would be awesome and I would love to see that PR. <laughs> I guess I'm next. Yeah. Oh, sure. Uh, hey. So I, I store my global variables in main and then all the renderer processes call that to get access to those mm -hmm. globals. How will I do that without remote? Um, so you won't. Um, the way to do that is to figure out what things you need to expose and uh, 
produce uh, uh, wrappers around them using invoke. So you, with invoke, you register a handler, say IPC main dot handle, and you say a channel, um, and like just a string, and then you call invoke with that string on the renderer process, and your function in the main process will get called. So. Um, and won't all applications have to recreate that very same thing over again? And that's what IPC renderer.invoke is there for. Um, so the idea is that you sh any functionality that needs to be uh, accessed over IPC from the renderer process, um, assuming that it fits the request response model here, uh, which like 99% of the, of the time it is what, uh, that's what we needed, um, uh, you'll be able to uh, register a handler using IPC main dot handle uh, and uh, get the get the value back um, using invoke. So it, it's definitely more work to do than uh, than it is with the remote. Um, I I I want things to be easier, and I'm open. I'm definitely open to hearing like ideas for how to do that. Um, there has to be a balance though between. Um, I, I think the remote module went too far on like pretending that it is a local object um, uh, and that makes things really hard to audit and, uh, and also isn't always true. So I think we need to strike a balance. Maybe IPC renderer.invoke is kind of too far down the like difficult path and people will just go reach for remote. Um, but I would like to sort of like understand why people are doing that on a, on a deeper level and see if we can provide tools in Electron that allow people to um, build more secure and more um, uh, performant uh, IPC. Great, thanks. Is there any other questions? We have one over here. Thank you. So how do you recommend that uh, two render process to communicate with each other? So currently we are using Send2, but I read that Send2 will also go through the main process. So is there yeah. any way? That's, that is a fantastic question. Um, I have been in playing around with some prototypes of ways to do that. There's currently a proposal in the API working group um, for a, a method to do that that's built on uh, message channels and message ports, which is a web API that you can use to talk between like web worker and a main, um, and a main page. Um, so uh, that's, that's what the current proposal is. So um, to answer your question directly, there's no way to talk to, directly renderer to renderer without using a native node module in Electron today. Um, but I think there should be, um, and I'm excited to like build that, and like I've, so I've heard a lot of um, people wanting to use that in their apps. Um, so yes, uh, that, that will exist, hopefully. That one over here. Thanks. Um, are there any performance concerns around like uh, size of uh, payloads for IPC messages going back and forth, like if you're moving a large amount of data? Um, yes. Um, the way that uh, all, all of those IPC uh, methods, uh, at least in Electron 7 and up, work um, is via the structured clone algorithm, uh, which is a serialization method. So whenever you send an object over IPC, um, and this is also the case with um, remote to some degree, it gets serialized. Um, into data, so that means reading out the whole structure, writing it into a buffer, and then like copying that into a pipe. Um, and so the larger your, uh, it's like order n, uh, it's like this, the larger your buffer is, the longer it's gonna take to transmit. There are a couple ways around this involving shared memory that, uh, so if you wanna send something like video buffers, um, video frames, there are, uh, I know that some people are using uh, uh, shared memory to do that. Um, and there's also, I have been exploring being able to use uh, like movable buffers. So that's like being able to like take a buffer um, and like uh, just send the handle to it, like uh, mark it as shared memory and just send the handle over. Um, and there is some like, this is called transferables in uh, web terminology. Um, we don't currently support them in Electron, but I would like to. And that's also part of that proposal um, that I mentioned about sending messages renderer to renderer. That would also extend to renderer to main process and it would work more like post message. Thanks. So, yeah. Cool. Any more questions? And okay. Well, thank, thank you, you very much, much Jeremy. Thank you.